I don't consider myself to be really necessarily in the true sense a leader leader or a disability advocate, but I'm more a person that is wants to learn, wants to know more about ADA, and that's what led me to be uh, to get involved with the CTA's ADA Advisory Committee. Uh, and I served on that for four years. The last uh, year and a half, I was actually the chairperson. You know, one of the things is because I am um, visually impaired, I'm actually legally blind. So, you know, I use uh, the white cane to get around. Uh, I'm an independent traveler. And I, when I, when I joined CTA, uh, the board four years ago, um, they were just then talking about um, the red and purple modernization project was going to be coming up to make the remaining, um, you know, 42, 43 stations accessible. And I had been noticing over, because I've been living in the, in the city for decades now, I'm not originally from Chicago, but might as well say I am because I've been here for so long, but just noticing the improvements in technology and accessibility between the train and the audible and et cetera. Uh, announcements and things that are helpful to people that are visually impaired getting around um, and I thought this would be a great way for me to get involved with CTA uh, now that they're going to be working on stations that are going to be impacting my commute. The biggest accomplishments for me would be first I would say using my voice actually understanding that as a person with a disability to share what your experience is and for it to be listened to and heard, and that you can see um, and experience what you share, that it does make a difference. And I think the first thing that I realized, and I was a little hesitant that day, because I'm like, ah, you know, should I really share this? Is it gonna make a difference? But when they started in the Wilson Project and they, you know, had basically demolished that station or whatever, how you wanna call it, you know, doing the renovations and the station was closed, uh, they did a lot of work, and I would walk to the Target. Well, in between uh, Lawrence and Sunnyside on Broadway, pretty much on Broadway, that's where the construction was, and there was always issues. Like, I would walk, and there would be confusion, where literally sighted people would be saying to me, and again, you know, I'm looking at the camera, but I am visually impaired, um, and I'm using a cane. Sighted people would be saying to me, can I walk down there? And it would crack me up, because I'm like, why are you asking me? I'm like, you should be able to see and tell. But that's how confusing it was with the construction. It was unclear whether or not you could walk there. Um, you know, and so one of the meetings I shared with them that I had asked for assistance from someone who was sighted and asked them, could I walk, you know, down this particular, because it was blocked off. And they said, oh, you know, they helped me. I think you just need to walk out the street and then you can get back on the sidewalk and then you'll be fine. So I did that. But literally, that was incorrect information. But there was not enough signage even for that person to know whether or not it was safe. So literally, I ended up walking in the street and realizing that cars are whizzing by me. I'm in the street. And I shared with CTA in one of our meetings how dangerous that was. That, you know, obviously, for liability purposes, you know, I could have gotten hit by a car. And that part of the problem was, not only is it for me as a uh, visually impaired person wouldn't have no way of knowing because they didn't properly have things um there's nothing you could shoreline you know there wasn't proper signage for someone that was um you know uh sighted or whatever you know to know and literally that next day after that one of the that particular day uh kevin irvine who um, was on the chairman of the board happened to be sitting in in the meeting he took that back to the uh, chairman and the board of CTA. Uh, within a day or two, Amy Serpy, the manager of um, ADA compliance, who is our facilitator for CTA ADA, ADA advisory committee, she's calling me and they have made changes where they actually put up fences. They added signage. I mean, she went out with one of their construction guys, explained to, because again, you know, they're using vendors, you know, to do these contracts. It's not actually CTA people doing these contracts and explain to the vendor, you know, what they needed to do to make this better. And I felt so good that just, you know, my sharing of my experience moving forward, hopefully, is, hopefully 
as you know, more projects like Wilson is go going to be occurring, you know, again, we've got over the next 20 years, 42 stations are going to be rehabbed, that now that's in the forefront of their minds, although I'm sure it was before, but even more so, you got to make sure that your vendors are on top of making sure that while these projects are going on, that it's got to be accessible, that it's got to be safe and accessible for all people that are going to be traveling along these sites to travel safely. Um, so I really felt good. That was kind of the one of the one of the compliments. But the later late, later one that was prior to being the chairperson is really to be able to shape kind of the agenda to have collaboration with our our, our team, the committee, because we had some wonderful people, uh, some great disability advocates working on um, that last year and a half that I was part of the CTA ADA advisory committee. Some great people, um, a great diverse group of people that were on it and able to set up uh, to recognize that for us to really accomplish some of the things that we wanted to do, you know, the ADA advisory committee only meets four times a year. And we decided as a group that we really needed to, to be more effective, find a way to work independently in between our quarterly meetings to push our agenda through. So we set up subcommittees and we, uh, in 2019, you know, um, set up a wayfinding subcommittee because we knew that it was important with technology and with all the, the uh, construction and rehab of these stations that was going to be happening to make sure that, you know, finding new ways. Part of the goal of the ADA advisory committee is to uh, increase ridership. So, um, you know, what, what can we do? What are the efforts that we need to do to promote that? And we thought with safety and training, that would be a great uh, subcommittee to do that. And the last one, of course, would be funding advocacy, because if we're pushing that we want, you know, more technology or if we want things that are going to cost money, we need to help um, advocate. We wanted to make sure that CTA is not just hearing the voice of a committee of 12, but, you know, expanding on hearing other voices and making sure that if we can, how can we make sure that other uh, people that are, you know, dealing with different uh, uh, challenges, traveling, um, CTA, getting their voices heard. I would say that the, um, I think one of the final things that I was um, most proud of was how we worked together with the funding advocacy subcommittee, and we were successfully able to collaborate with CTA so that they were, a, they were awarded $20 million dollars for a, uh, from the Chicago Metropolitan um, Council um, with a uh, uh, STP shared funding, which is typically something that would go to um, highway projects. And it was the first time that those funds were diverted to something like, um, you know, a transportation agency. So it was, that was really, you know, rewarding, I think for the whole um, ADA advisory committee to be able to play a part of that because we actually, you know, spoke at CMAP and uh, and then we did a, a kind of a campaign within the um, disability community to advocate for people to write in. And so it felt good that we were able to um, assist and help with, um, you know, actually funding that's going towards, uh, so critical um, because that funding is for um, the uh, Green Line Station in Austin getting that station uh, renovated so that it is ADA compliant. Um, because right now it's just, it's not accessible for people with, um, if you have, you know, have, if you, you know, have, uh, there's no elevators. So it is not accessible at all um, for anybody that has uh, mobility um, issues in terms of either in a wheelchair or maybe if you're, you know, um, needing to get up those steps and, you know, you just uh, got bad knees, whatever the case may be, um, it's not an accessible station. What really stands out to me is with the subcommittees that you help bring into fruition, I, uh, they, at least to me, I feel like they're really going to have um, a place post-COVID or post uh, once plans start to come together for creating new structures post-COVID, um, because I think, you know, for wayfinding, 
wayfinding for stations are going to have to look different. You yeah. Know, adding in new elements of sanitation, if you're going to yes. make that a requirement for people, there are different surfaces that people are going to touch that you're then going to try to, um, to try to avoid. So like wayfinding changes it that way. Mm-hmm. People who are recovering from the illness, um, you know, the, you're, we're talking about a large population that's going to have newly acquired disabilities and might have decreased lung function, which is going to play a big role into how easily they're going to be able to get up a couple of flights of stairs to a train stop. Um, so, you know, I um, and then, of course, the funding behind behind all of that. I think that uh, you're so right. I mean, you know, we just don't know with this this is going to be a new normal and we're, we're going to still be finding out what that new normal is going to look like, you know? So, um, I agree, you know, it's, uh, these subcommittees will definitely, um, even when you talk about safety and training, play a role in all of that, you know? Do you help, um, lead such, uh, important, uh, role for the CTA and the accessibility of the CTA? Um, through the committee, what do you think it takes to lead a diverse committee? One where um, you're ac- you're accurately pinpointing the actual issues that you're trying to problem solve for. You know, it's interesting. I think that um, the the CTA ADA, ADA advisory committee is is pretty di- diverse group of people. I mean, to, you're you know you had. Um, multiple people on there that were visually impaired and or blind various levels of you know vision to no vision um guide dog to cane not using a cane you know using wheelchairs we had someone that is um you know that was uh deaf and um and then other challenges as well some that are not you know necessarily disclosed and i think that it's just like anybody and everybody should be um, having empathy, you know what I mean? And, and really putting yourself in somebody else's um, situation and hopefully trying to look at it like, if that was me, how would I get around? How would I, um, you know, deal with this situation? What could I do to make that better? But it, it really takes listening. And I think that's one of the first things you have to, you have to listen and you have to want to um, have the spirit of collaboration um, and kind of together, you know, willing to like work together and share our voices so that, you know, we're able to, at the end, make some real change. And I think that that's the, the great thing about the, the committee that we did have um, you know, obviously you included on that is that it was a great people group of people that were respectful of one another, uh, listen to each other, um, and, um, willing to hear each other's challenges and help everybody move forward on whatever your particular situation may be. We're all looking at it as a way to help each other, um, with the diversity because it are, you know, our community, the disabled community, or differently abled community, whichever way you want to look at it, or the herbage you want to use, we're diverse. And um, trying to represent all of that can certainly be a challenge. And I think that, um, you know, we definitely try to do that between our committee, reaching out to, uh, you know, people that would come and make public comments, uh, making sure that they feel like felt like they were being listened to and their concerns that they were voicing and taking the time to come out and share were actually listened to, but but that actually actively something was done about it. And I think that that was um, that's the key to those kind of committees is that you have to do the listening, but you actually have to take the steps for acting, you know, for some sort of action. Um, and uh, hopefully that's what we did. Um, particularly, um, you know, over this last uh, year and a half or year that, you know, you were on the committee. You know, I'm one of these people that I love learning. You know, I love to experience, I, you know, I, I wanted to do something different, experiencing, experience something new, but I also have kind of the strong desire to be of service. And um, CTA was at that time uh, one of the ways that I could volunteer and feel like I was going to be a service. Um, 
And, but I don't, it's so crazy because I don't necessarily consider myself to be a leader in the true sense of what I think of the, of the word, but I'm more of a person that I think in your like day to day, um, you know, as you, you move about, um, without us even knowing about it, particularly a person that, you know, travels alone, uh, you know, visually impaired traveling alone, as I said, I'm an independent travel, I'm a cane user. I'm always surprised by, and I'm, I'm made aware of it by the people in, in my community that I live in that will sometimes say something, you know, um, they'll approach me and say something and like, I'm not even aware that they're paying attention to me, you know, traveling on my own. Um, but I think that, you know, as people with, you know, again, disabilities or differently abled, um, we can, as we just, all of us, as we are out there in the community and just walking around and just living our lives, because that's what we're doing. We're just living our lives like anybody else. Uh, we're making an impact and we are actually advocating whether we know it or not in those moments. And I think that's what's so interesting about it. So I am, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't consider my, I'm far from being a, because uh, certainly on the ADA advisory committee, um, and like you, Whitney, I would consider you more of a professional advocate. You know, I am not that, but I am more of kind of just the everyday person just leading their lives, but um, advocating in that moment or in that space as I'm walking around for, for somebody that is um, differently abled or dis disabled. Um, in my precinct, you know, I was having issues where uh, obviously you know, they have the um, accessible voting equipment and it's always sometimes a challenge. I mean, this is not new where the people that are, you know, volunteering with the polls, they might have issues setting up that equipment. So either sometimes you're waiting excessively long for them to get it together or, and you could be waiting long and then they never get together. Um, and I finally decided in my neighborhood, I, I just got tired of it um, because, you know, the, the our state is paying for this equipment and uh, I'm sure it wasn't cheap and it's there and people are supposedly trained on it and they should be able to get that, you know, I have the right to vote, you know, with independently with the, through that accessibility equipment that they have paid for um, so that I can uh, vote using the um, audio and you know, I am proud of myself that I actually went ahead and I, you know, I, I ended up, you know, reaching out to Equip for Equality uh, multiple times, actually twice. And now, you know, at my polling place, when I come in, it's funny. They actually, they see me, Miss Davis is here, um, you know, like get the equipment ready. You know what I mean? But we've come to an understanding where now I, I am voting, uh, you know, without issues. And I think one of the things that was interesting about it too, this last time where we finally got it right before that, one of the poll workers said to me, well, you know, you were, they weren't able to get the equipment working, but her point was, but you were able to vote. And I thought about it and I thought, yeah, you're right. I was able to vote with your assistance. Um, and as an African-American person, at that same time, I realized in this country at that particular election, other people weren't able to vote. There was voter uh, 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 large in some states. There was uh, a lot of issues with voter suppression. And but at the same time, I wasn't able to vote in the way that I was entitled to vote. And that's when I decided, you know what, I, I get what you're saying, but I am still going to have to address the situation. And I'm so glad that I did. I'm so glad that I reached out to Equip for Equality, um, you know, and I appreciate all these organizations that are actually, and that's to my point too, those are the people that are really doing the Access Living, Equip for Equality, and all the other organizations out there that are really doing the true advocacy work um, to make sure that, you know, we are able to lead the lives that we should be able to. Um, and so, uh, you know, but... I'm doing, I think, a little bit of my part, trying to do a little bit of my part in that that role. So, well, you know, it's amazing because the more, honestly, the more people like you, you talk about the space that you're claiming and you do educate others on that. Um, you, everything that you're saying, like, I can't even imagine the ripple effect, you know, because yeah. 
your voting pre precinct actually did what they were supposed to do and yep. voting accessible, that then means that anyone else who lived in your area was able to vote that much more independently. Right. Uh, and I think that it's really easy to forget the our own power and our voice. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things I've definitely learned through like that example that I just gave you um, with the voting and definitely with CTA that we just have sometimes just have to feel comfortable speaking up a little, you know what I mean? Because sometimes I think anybody thinks, ah, uh, you know, who's going to listen? Is it going to make a difference? But it is. And sometimes even just a little bit of things, like you just said, a little ripple effect, you know, you just don't know where that's going to go to. Um, and particularly even, and it's one of those things that's so crazy because, you know, I know that uh, access benefits everyone, you know, that's one of those kind of, but it's so true because even when you think about the voting, you know, now I'm doing audio because I can't see. However, there are people who need it in different languages. Maybe you don't have uh, a visual issue, but you need that audio maybe to, to speak to you in whatever your, um, the language that you're most comfortable in. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the ways that access benefits everybody because mm -hmm. they got that working. Maybe there's somebody that needed that for whatever language that they, that they speak so they could hear, you know, they could vote in with their language, you know, so you just, you just never know. Um, and I think that's one of the cool things about advocating for people with disabilities because Whatever needs to be done for our gains is actually benefiting everybody in ways that we don't even know to the fullest. But it just absolutely is. You know, I, as I was thinking about when you, you know, asked me to do this today, you know, I think back on, um, you know, when I first came to the Chicagoland area to go to college, and, you know, I'm a 17 year old kid at that time because with, I have an eye disease, retinitis pigmentosa. It wasn't at the level um, where a, you know, I, I didn't use a cane. I think I was legally blind at that time, but you know, I still had um, vision where it wasn't that kind of issue. It wasn't until you know decades later that you know um, definitely had to add a cane, and you know, uh, my quote unquote disability was apparent, you know, to, to folks. Um, but I remember as a kid talking to the dean of the school, and this is 80s, early 80s. And this gentleman, you know, said to me, I asked him, I said, well, you know, I'm visually impaired. I may need to uh, record, you know, like lectures or something like that, you know. And he, he, he immediately interjected and said, we are a private institution. We do not have to accommodate you. Uh -huh. And I was like, and I, and I had no clue at that time. Like, it went over my head. You know what I mean? Like I knew being African American, I recognized the attitude. It's because that that comment stuck with me for my life. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I at that time did not understand quite what he meant. Because I'm like, accommodations? What are you talking about? Because that's not what I was talking about. I was just letting you know I might be recording something. You know what I mean? And now look what you're doing. You know, you've got you know a bunch of accessible pedestrian signals that you you probably had more on that, uh, and I'm somewhat exaggerating but you have more on that and on that small campus than what the city of chicago has in the whole city so um you know i'm very grateful for when you look at all of that for um for ada but there's just so much more work that needs to be done um in terms of enforcing it it's kind of like the civil rights movement you know you have the laws but then you got to work on the enforcement just like with voting everybody has the right to vote but there's still there's laws in place, but they just have to be enforced. Um, and I think that's what we're, these different agencies like Access Living, Equip for Quality, and again, so many others that I can't name are, are doing that hard work, you know, to make sure that things are being enforced and that we, we continue to move forward. Um, so, uh, you know, 30 years, um, it's it's definitely made a difference when I, when I think about 30 years and I think about like I said, early 80s and what that dean said to me. And I went back and I, I, I'm like, wow, what a difference that made, you know, so. 
it's also amazing how when it comes to just basic accessibility, how most of the time some of the simplest solutions to just be a little bit more accessible gets completely overlooked um, as yeah. a topic science. And yeah. that is where I truly believe that people themselves are not disabled as the environment that makes you disabled. It, exactly, exactly. My concerns with everything that we've been talking about, COVID, the racial protests, um, just everything that is happening in our society. Um, what are some of your biggest concerns? You know how you like realize that we are interconnected, but you know, I consider myself to be independent. And I would know, like, for example, if I go to Target, you know, I may ask for assistance from someone to help me go shop for something, right? Well, when COVID came about, it was like, ooh, I don't, now I don't feel comfortable asking them because they may not feel comfortable helping me. If I go, are they gonna help me? Will they help me? Um, you know, we've got the social distancing issue. You're visually impaired. You're you're traveling independently. Um, very difficult to social distance. Um, and at times, you know, feeling like literally, you know, I would, you know, uh, get up and get out at 6 a.m. You know, before you know, I mean, and really nobody was out at, at you know when we're talking about March and April and neighborhoods and stuff like that. But um, at least in mine, you know, that early, but so I could avoid people because it was just a challenge. You know, I worried about being able to social distance correctly, you know what I mean? And, 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 you know, trying to be a good citizen. Um, I, and then hearing things like, you know, as I read about, you know, people that need assistance and you have people coming into your home and just things that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily kind of think about how we're all connected, interconnected, but when something like that happens, it turns critical. Um, because now maybe folks can't come into your home. They don't feel comfortable coming in your home and says, how do you get the assistance that you need? Um, even on a job, say if you're visually impaired and you have a reader, you know, someone that's reading to you, they can't technically come into your home either. So now everybody's working remotely and you have a reader, how are you doing your job? Without that, I mean, there's so many things that I think it brought attention to just the interconnectedness of us um, that uh, was interesting to me um, and things that we need to think about moving forward, things that we should have already, I mean, I, I think a lot of people already were um, thinking about, but even something as basic as you would think if you went to going to the hospital you know, and they only wanted one person to come, but for whatever reason, you may need to have somebody else with you. There might have been an issue with that. So you needed somebody, these organizations to, adv to advocate to say, hey, no, they need to have that individual with them to assist. Um, and I think those are some of the things that really brought attention to the whole COVID. It just kind of, it, it in so many ways, brought a spotlight to just all the issues that we need to work on um, within our community and 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 just the the larger uh, community, human community, because um, there's so many things to work on, so many things to attack at this point, um, you know, post COVID that we're going to need to work on to to improve upon. But I, my concern is is that the accessibility piece, you know, um, on so many levels, we don't lose that. Um, because that's key. I don't necessarily like, consider myself to be this grand leader, but I, through my voice, either I can, through an organization, join in a writing campaign, you know, write my, um, you know, senator, my congressperson, whatever, to advocate for some of these issues that I believe in for our community. And I think everybody can take the time to do that because um, so many organizations make it easy for us where it's basically, you know, a form letter that all you need to do is kind of, uh, they do all the work for you. And if you want to do some editing to kind of make it more personalized, certainly that would be great, but you don't have to. It's uh, just making sure that, you know, we're getting as many voices are being heard on issues. Um, and that's one of the easy ways to get involved, I think. Do you think that um, 
currently the disabled community is being involved enough with this narrative and with this look at restructuring programs. With the disability community, it often seems like you have people that want to talk on our behalf, you know what I mean? Instead of us necessarily being at the table. Um, and I think that's the struggle is always making sure that we are, you know, nothing about us without us. That literally we're at the table speaking for ourselves, not somebody else speaking on our behalf. And I think that's an ongoing, you know, challenge. You know, you may consider it, it, it as an individual to be something small, but like we were talking about earlier, you just don't know what your actions, what that ripple effect will do, you know, um, with just in terms of just, you know, getting out and about and living your lives and, and uh, being out in your community, you have no idea what ripple effects somebody that's observing you moving around, you know, what that might change. You know, you just don't know. You, you don't know because I think we're just all so interconnected. You, you just don't know. And I think that so many of us are advocating and we don't even know it, you know, um, just like, as I said, every day that you're getting out there and, and living your life. Any way that you're able to share your experiences, um, either through an organization. Um, I think sometimes we lose the sense that just in talking about what we're experiencing, that that can have an impact. And I think that sharing that is so important um, just to bring about change. And as I said, I mean, with um, ADA being 30 years this, this month, um, I really believe that access benefits everybody. I mean, all the things that ADA has done, um, you know, you take something simple like a curb cut, you know, um, who doesn't use that? I mean, you know, that or um, the, uh, the accessible doors, everybody's using that, you know, um, but there's just so many other things that are beneficial um, to the overall uh, world based on, um, you know, the, the work that the disability community has done to make our lives better. It's actually improved everyone else's. The same thing with the civil rights movement. Um, look at the ripple effect that had, you know, that impacted its humanity. I mean, uh, bottom line, I mean, it's all about impacting humanity, making um, everyone lives better. You know, I definitely, I feel like I'm a work in progress. I am, you know, working on, I'm one of these people that, that is working on self-acceptance, you know, certainly I can see where there's, you know, the challenges that we face, but there's also that internal battle that we face, you know, and I just, I'm always working on not limiting myself because that's where it starts. I don't have any control over somebody else and their limiting beliefs, but I definitely have control over my own. And uh, that's why I say I'm a work in progress, always making sure, checking in with Angela, that I'm not putting limits on me. Um, and that no matter what, even with my visual impairment, I'm determined to live the best life that I can. My sentence to me would be a work in progress, you know, um, definitely a work in progress.